Let me just say, uh, yeah. Let me just say hello. I see a bunch of names of. I have a lot of old friends at UCLA. I see uh, Ellie Oaks's name up there somewhere. I see Alan Fisk, uh, Patricia, and I are long, long time buddies. So, uh, yeah, I love, it's great to be here. It's great to it's great to have you visit, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to to zoom in and talk to us, and we're really looking forward to um, hearing your talk. And um, it's also great in the in the era of Zoom that um, it means that we get to see, I get to see uh, lots of people that I don't see very often as well. Um, it's a good context for me to, to see Patricia, who I haven't seen in a while, and Rob, uh, a bunch of other people that, uh, you know, it's nice to, to all come together for these Zoom occasions. Uh, and it's a little bit of a silver lining during the, the pandemic. So um, before I introduce your, your, your talk, Mike, uh, let me... Um, just say, uh, make an announcement for people here about our talk next week. So you all, you all know um, about the Beck Speaker Series. You can find information at beck.ucla.edu. There's a listserv. Uh, if you go to the Get Involved tab, you can just enter your email and it will um, put you on the listserv and then you'll get all of the announcements about the series. Um, and uh, next Monday, um, I'm pleased that we will be welcoming Dorsa Amir, Dr. Dorsa Amir, uh, who is a UCLA alumna and um, is now a and, a, and and a former Beck member who now is a postdoc at Boston College in the Department of Psychology. And Dorsa's talk will be called The Development of Decision-Making Across Diverse Cultural Contexts. Um, so that's next week, February 8th at noon. Today, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Michael Tomasello to join us. Mike is uh, a, a former uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology at Leipzig and is still affiliated with MPI Leipzig and uh, is currently professor of psychology and neuroscience at um, Duke University. And um, it's great to, to have you um, back to visit us, Mike. And Mike's talk is called Becoming Human, A Theory of Ontogeny. Um, if you all want to unmute yourselves for a moment, please uh, join me in welcoming Mike. And I'll, I'll set up screen share for you. Uh, we set it up so you can share your screen. We didn't test that out previously, but it should work. Okay, you ready? Okay, that looks yep. fine. Um, how is that? Yep, we can see the, yeah, you might want to just, there you go, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, again, thanks for having me. I, I don't really remember exactly when the last time I visited was, but it was uh, probably, I don't know, 15 or 15 years ago or something. So yeah, you came and it was, yeah, it was probably early 2000s, maybe. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, in addition to Patricia, I've been longtime friends with uh, Rob and uh, uh, and Joan, who were visiting in the Leipzig some and whatnot. So, so anyway, it's nice to be back, at least virtually. And uh, maybe I should just uh, uh, start with that. Then I'll start with a theory that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Your erstwhile Rob boy. Uh, when I started out, really in doing the research that I'm going to talk about today. I started from this sort of general bias that uh, culture was of utmost importance in uh, human ontogeny. Uh, Patricia obviously been a pioneer in that point of view. Uh, but uh, like Rob and others, uh, I thought that some of the traditional views of culture as divorced from evolution, uh, you know, don't work. And your department as a whole has been at the forefront of thinking of culture in an evolutionary context. So the dual inheritance theory, from, I'm a trained developmental psychologist and I you know, studied a good bit of evolution and stuff, but my, my formal training is in developmental psychology. And so to me, the dual inheritance theory means something like this, that you have the evolution of the species uh, where certain capacities uh, evolve. You have your culture and that of course, that's Rob and Pete, uh, the cultural evolution, of course, over time, and that's not the that's not the species, that's the cultural group. But then my focus has been the individual, and the individual undergoes an ontogeny, 
um, and it inherits both uh, its um, genes uh, as of the species and it inherits the cultural practices and artifacts of its cultural group. Obviously inherit in slightly different ways, but nevertheless, you're born into your culture uh, and so you inherit it in that sense. Um, I have also long been in psychology uh, a student of Vygotsky and Vygotsky was the one who uh, emphasized in developmental psychology, psychology as a whole, the important role of culture, the fact that humans couldn't do hardly any of the things they do without symbols and tools and uh, all kinds of cultural prostheses. Um, I call what I am doing now Neo-Vygotskyan because Vygotsky did not really I mean, he wrote in the you know, 1930s, so I guess give him a break, and died at age 34, so give him a break on that one too. But uh, uh, he didn't really talk much about evolution. And so in the modern view, I would say that you have to be talking about biological, um, biologically evolved capacities for soaking up culture uh, during your ontogeny. And so that's the sort of perspective that I brought uh, to developmental psychology and I've speculated some on human evolution as well. Um, so our, our first really huge, really big study to sort of address this question more or less directly. And I think actually, I think Rob and Joan have this exact figure in their textbook, as I recall, and they did in certainly one of the earlier ones. So, uh, so there is a, um, a synergy there. And, uh, you know, this is a very large scale, 105 two-year-old children, roughly about two and a half, 106 chimpanzees and 32 orangutans. 106 chimpanzees took quite some doing, but, uh, but we managed it. Uh, and this was a whole battery of tests. Um, and I'm, this is the highest level, most general summary. Over here, the tests for uh, what we call physical causality, understanding space, understanding causality, understanding quantities in the social domain, social learning, communication, and TOMS theory of mind, reading intentions and so forth. And what we found was that two and a half year old children have basically the same skills with space, causality, meaning meanly tool use, choosing the appropriate tool for the appropriate uh, causal problem and quantities. Two and a half year old children and chimps have almost exactly the same. In fact, the chimps are just a millimeter uh, higher. And so that, man, that I, I, I like that a lot anyway. But basically two year, two year old children have their general issue grade eight skills of dealing with the physical world. But when it came to these social skills, what you see is that the children on average are uh, close to double what the apes are in terms of the way we scored their ability to imitatively learn a novel, uh, how to use a novel object, how to communicate, and we didn't mean language, but gestural communication of showing people where things were and stuff, and reading intentions. So um, one way to interpret this is this is at least poking around and getting at the idea that, that humans have some special adaptations for social life in general, culture uh, in particular. Now, one of the criticisms of this studies uh, was that uh, these are two and a half year old children and these are adult apes. So what we, what we really need is ontogeny in both. And that's really hard uh, logistically to get young chimps and it's hard to test them uh, when they're two years old in the absence of their mothers and so forth. But I'll spare you the details. You, there's the reference if you want to go look at it. But we did it. And we, it was a combination of longitudinal and um, cross-sectional methods. So we had a small group that we tested at two and a half, three and a half, and four and a half longitudinally. And we had a, at each age uh, supplemented with some cross-sectional sample. And what we found was, so if you look, the graphs, you've you got to kind of use your uh, uh, perspective shifting abilities here. Uh, the graph here, we replicated the finding from the last graph. If you look at the leftmost column here, the leftmost column is two-year-olds and chimps are the same at physical cognition. And two-year-olds are different in social cognition. I should say the sample is a completely different sample, obviously, because they're youngsters. And it also includes bonobos. I just put the chimps here, but uh, the bonobos are were about a third of the sample or something like that. So it's pan, um, genus pan. So the leftmost column 
replicates the original result with a new population and with the appropriate age uh, match. And then if you look at the next longitudinal age, three years old, now the human children are still higher and at four year olds even more, even still higher in social cognition and the physical cognition is uh, moving up too. Now one interpretation, these data don't speak to it directly, is that the social is leading the physical because the physical is things like learning to use tools uh, and, and choose appropriate tools and kids are getting social input from that between age two and age three. Adults are showing them how to do things, explaining how to do things in language and so forth. Their quantitative skills, they're learning how to count because people are teaching them. So again, these data don't speak to it, but one interpretation would be that the reason the children are, are getting higher and all these things in the physical cognition, why children become uh, sort of smarter across the board, if you wanna think of it like that, is because the social cognition is leading the way. Now, interesting sidelight to this, I just want to um, uh, uh, mention for those of you more uh, attuned to the uh, uh, physical dimension of things, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to the brain in particular, here's a plot of relative brain growth. Now, we all know that in adulthood, humans have brains that are roughly three times the size of apes. This is uh, um, uh, uh, controlling for that. This is your um, relative brain size for your species. And what you see is that chimps are born with, at, with roughly 50% of adult brain size. At two and a half, they're, at age two, they're already up to close to 90%, uh, and, uh, and they're, they're at close to 100% uh, early by four or five years old. Children are born with more like 25%, so about half their adult brain size. And at age two, they're at half, and they're not at uh, close to 100, you're not getting close to 100 until they're eight years old. So here's an explanation for these developmental uh, uh, graphs you see above. There's the age we're testing, okay? The age we're testing is two and a half to four and a half, and the chimps are already leveled up. They're, they're already at close to 90% brain size at two and a half, at over 90% brain size at two and a half and 98 or something at age four and a half. And the children are going from a little over 50% to 75%. So that's a 50% growth in their brain between size between two and a half and four and a half. So, so th these results are not surprising in the sense that the, 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 the youngster apes are not doing anything that different from the adult apes because they're, you know, they're already, um, uh, neurologically uh, mature, even at when we start getting them at two years old. No, we have not been able to test below two years of age. <laughs> it's impossible. They're they're on their moms and uh, whatever. So uh, uh, I think we're gonna have to be happy with this for the developmental data. But my my successor in Leipzig, Daniel Hound, that's one of his projects is to do more on ontogeny in uh, great apes. So uh, I have uh, written a couple of books that have a title of a natural history where I've given some evolutionary speculations about how we get from apes to humans. And obviously what I mean is the last common ancestor to apes, uh, to chimpanzees, bonobos and humans some 6 million years ago. Uh, and I have, I understand all of the uh, issues, but I've been using chimps and bonobos as kind of models of the last common ancestor. Okay, okay, anybody wants to argue about that, we can. But, uh, and I'm not distinguishing chimps from uh, bonobos there because uh, the, at the level I'm uh, looking at it, they're, uh, they're similar enough that they're more like the last, last common ancestor and humans are more different. So my model evolutionarily that I've worked out, and this is also in a, uh, um, a co-authored 2012 current anthropology article on two steps uh, in, the, in the evolution of human cooperation. So the idea is that great apes, let's say the last common ancestor, were mainly driven by social competition. Yes, they do some cooperative things. Uh, I'll talk about that later, but mainly driven by competition. All of the models of behavioral ecology of apes are all driven by competition. Then humans somewhere, I would say fairly recently, maybe half a million years ago, maybe 400,000 years ago, Homo heidelbergensis would be a, a good guess. Uh, they're starting to do something a little bit different. 
And in the domain of foraging, for example, that's where we can make inferences from the fossil record, they're beginning to engage in collaborative foraging. Um, and this collaborative foraging, I have uh, proposed change the way that humans um, think about the world and interact with one another. And um, I borrowed from uh, philosophy of action, this notion of shared intentionality. So apes are very smart uh, individually and they engage in all kinds of um, <clears throat> rational, uh, individually rational behavior to maximize their, um, their uh, uh, rewards. Humans are now becoming interdependent with one another. They were forced into some new foraging niche where they had to uh, collaborate with others or die. So if they tried to forage on their own, they wouldn't do as well, wouldn't have as many children and so forth. Uh, and so they evolved capacities, psychological capacities, cognitive and social capacities for a new kind of collaboration. And you're going to see some of that. That's going to be part of my argument today is to show you comparative experiments between young human children uh, as the uh, inheritors of these uh, uh, adaptations and chimps as representative of the last common ancestor, even though obviously they have changed to some degree. Um, and the second step in, and this is in uniquely human, in the, along the uniquely human line, is culture or collective intentionality. So first collaboration with other individuals, and I call that joint intentionality, and then collective behavior in a cultural group, collective intentionality. And these two steps in human evolution are going to manifest themselves in human ontogeny as the unfolding of maturational capacities. So um, uh, at around, so look up here in the, this is my book that from which the title of my talk comes, Becoming Human, uh, A Theory of Ontogeny. It's, uh, I guess, it came out in 2019. Um, and so this first uh, uh, evolved capacity for joint intentionality, for engaging with other individuals in especially cooperative ways is going to emerge at around, we call it the nine month revolution, around one year of age. And the second uh, evolved set of capacities for special behavior in social groups, in cultural groups, uh, working with conventions, norms, institutions, these things that um, are group level phenomena in humans, that's gonna, the, the capacity for that, not the final flowering of it, but the capacity begins to open up at around three years of age. So the book goes over um, eight domains of human ontogeny, uh, four of the, of uniquely, I wanna again stress, this book is not about human ontogeny in general. It's not about dealing with objects and tools and stuff, which apes do also. It's about the uniquely human parts. And the hypothesis is that all of the uniquely human aspects uh, of human development are coming from this putting your heads together with others, either with other individuals, which begins around one year, or with the group at large and their conventions, norms, and institutions uh, at starting at around age three. So I have four domains of uniquely human social ontogeny, collaboration, prosociality, social norms, moral things, and uniquely human co cognitive ontogeny, social cognition, theory of mind, leading to understanding of beliefs and false beliefs and all of that. Communication, not just language, but also other uh, uniquely human gestures like pointing and pantomiming. Cultural learning of special types, including pedagogy and cooperative thinking, where we put our heads together uh, the way that all of us do as scientists when we work in teams and we figure out things that none of us could figure out on our own. So that's, that's the overall theory. I call it Neo-Vygotskyan because Vygotsky uh, um, proposed that the uh, uniquely human uh, aspects of human development come from sociocultural interactions. And I'm trying to supply the evolutionary underpinnings to that and say that there are two maturational capacities that come online at around one year and around three years that are enabling humans 
children to begin interacting with others in unique ways. So, you know, your, your, your household pet, <laughs> even though you treat them like they're a child, they don't turn into a human. And even apes who are raised by humans, even though they do some incredible things, they don't turn into humans and they don't, uh, uh, um, well, anyway, I'll, I'll leave that one aside. But uh, it's obvious that you need the maturational capacities, but you also need the actual interaction. And let me just stress there, in case people who are more culturally oriented are worried this is too maturational, uh, I have from the very beginning that I had been developing this theory, I have said a child on a desert island, a child raised on a desert island with no other social contact would not develop uniquely human characteristics in any of these. And I'm very careful to say these are capacities. These are maturationally um, expressed capacities but they don't realize until they are exercised in uh, social cultural interactions. So a child raised on a desert island, uh, miraculously kept alive, but not having any social action interaction whatsoever would not develop these capacities. You have to have both. Okay, and, and, and children with autism are a potential model for um, uh, problems with these evolved capacities. Uh, the, the, a lot of the things that are uniquely human here are things they're not very good at. They're not very good at social learning. They're not very good at um, uh, collaboration. They're not very uh, good at communication and so forth. Okay, so um, the, the, very, the starting point... Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, when I'm in full screen, I don't have my, my clock here. I gotta see what time it is. Um, so the starting point here is this nine month revolution where this uh, um, uh, starts to happen. And um, I wanna show you three little quick videos and then I'm gonna show you a chimp in a somewhat similar situation. Uh, I apologize ahead of time for, uh, this is me on the left here with my daughter. I had a, I had a late child. Um, and this was her nine-month birthday to the day. And I've been talking about the nine-month revolution for many years. And so I want to roll the ball toward her. I want to see if she can engage in a kind of a collaborative activity of rolling this ball back and forth. And I get a little excited. I got, I got the sibling on the, on, the, on, on the camera, but here we go. Now I roll it to her. Now watch. She's going to roll it back. Amazing. But then, and she looks to the face. This is important. Watch where she's looking. She looks to my face. She's having trouble doing the ball rolling, but then every time she looks to the face and I roll it back to her and she rolls it back and I'm so excited. I can't, it comes back to her by accident. Now look, then she looks to the face. Okay, so the looks to the face are the operationalization of why this is a shared activity. She's interested in my reaction to her behavior. And it gives you, it gives you the, the, the shared feeling. I can tell you that I've interacted directly with juvenile uh, chimps and bonobos a, a good bit in Leipzig. And this look to the face of kind of like, did you see that kind of look is, um, is one of the things that phenomenologically fee makes you feel connected more than almost anything else. Now, the second down here at the bottom is showing, this is a very simple behavior. This is about a one-year-old child, I think 14 months. And this is a behavior that most children show pre-linguistically and happens very quickly, but I just want to want you to see it very quickly. This is something that you will not see in an ape ever. That's it. And this behavior, I think Patricia actually studied this kind of behavior way back in her early lang language stuff on pre-linguistic uh, uh, precursors of language. Um, what is the motivation for this? The motivation is just, look, isn't this cool? <laughs> okay, that's it. And if you say, well, this is a little funny little child thing, I would say that's essentially the motivation for much of our conversation, uh, which we classify as gossip. Did you hear about this? Did you hear who's dating whom? Did you hear see the game last night? What is that all about? That's just, look, isn't this cool? That's a grown-up version of, look, isn't this cool? So this is something that you do not see in apes, and they can do, and children do this with pointing as well, not just holding up and showing, but also pointing and saying, look over there, isn't that cool? Um, and so this is a kind of a sharing motivation that's an active engagement for joint attention, not in the, in the collaboration. She was reacting. I started things. I got it going. She reacted, uh, and she looked at me in ways that were um, uh, engaging. Here's a kid in, initiating joint attention. Um, and uh, again, I think it was uh, your colleague, uh, 
who I think is deceased now, but um, um, uh, uh, sorry, the autism uh, in, 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 in the UCLA Center there. Um, Miriam, Miriam. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, she studied joint attention, and especially in, in children with autism, uh, and exactly these kind of behaviors. This is uh, the um, expressive joint attention. I think the autism people call it, where, the, where they're um, where they're trying to engage the other. And this is something that children with autism are are particularly uh, bad at. In general, there's a spectrum, but in general, not very good at it. And third here is the classic book reading. And again, I want you to look at where this, this is my daughter again. I think it's uh, at the same day. I think it is. That it's, yeah, wearing, it looks the same. and wearing the same shirt. I think it's the same day. Uh, nine month birthday. And mom is doing the book reading uh, and pointing. And But watch when, when she's looking at the book, she's got to go to great effort to turn around and look at mom to share attention with mom. Look mm -hmm. oh, there. Okay, cool. And then she says something that sounds like baby and everybody goes crazy. Baby, baby. Baby. <laughs> okay. And the sibling on the camera gets very excited. But anyway, okay. So this complex of things here is a form of engagement with others that you do not see in apes. That's my whole argument in a nutshell. I could skip the rest of the talk. This form of engagement, you just don't see. And it is triadic. That's why we call it shared intentionality. You intend things toward things. It's shared intentionality because you and I are sharing things toward some third thing. My daughter and I are sharing attention to the ball and the game of rolling the ball. This child in the bottom is initiating joint attention to the block. The daughter here is sharing attention to the book. So it's, a, it's a, an engagement between the two of us toward some third thing. It's not like chimpanzees playing and grooming and stuff, which is directly dyadic face to face. It's outside of our face to face toward some third thing. And obviously, this is the basic structure of reference in language. This is you and me talking about some third thing. Uh, now, here's a chimp. This, 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 I'm going to let this run here about two minutes, I think it is. But uh, I tried to find some snippets. This is a human race chimp. Uh, and she's about uh, three years old here, I believe. Oh yeah, here it is, 36 months old. And I say the same toys. These are similar toys. And just watch the engagement. This is her, her caretaker that she's her mom close to. All right, she's got the ball and mom is kind of pointing to it and says, give it to me. And now she wants to play with it. So she's bouncing it and wants to play with it. All right, let's play together with the ball. And the chimp is interested in the ball, but not in playing with it together, okay? The ball is fun. Let's do some fun stuff with it. Let's put it in the bucket. Let's put it on our head. Let's bounce it around. But she doesn't care about playing with it with the care caretaker. <laughs> there she is, doing fun things. All right, now that was a cut. There's a new segment here. They're gonna do the book reading. The chimp, uh, this is Annette. Annette is fascinated with the book. She's following the pointing gesture to these things. That is, she's, she's paying attention, but you don't see any turning around. You don't see any vocalizing. You don't see her trying to share attention with the caretaker uh, about the book. Okay. Now, she has plenty of opportunity. Here she has a rake. I can imagine a young child picking up the rake or picking up the car and holding it up to the caretaker like that little boy did and say, oh, look at this. Isn't it cool? But she doesn't do that now. Absence of doing it doesn't mean she can't do it, but we don't observe it. And she's looking at the book by herself, okay? She's fascinated, but she doesn't try to tell the adult, look at this, or do anything to share the book. Now she's gonna try the ball again, and again, the ball is fun, but not to share. Okay? So this is the contrast. This is the beginning of the contrast. It's a kind of engagement with others around things that you get in humans that you don't get in great apes. And this is called shared intentionality because again, intentionality is outward directed, but we're sharing our outward directedness, sharing our outward directed activity. We're going toward a shared goal. We're sharing attention about things um, and we're gonna communicate together about things. And yeah, that's it. So this is what I call the shared intentionality schema. And it's a, what I, I think of it as a dual level structure. That is, 
it is both, I keep stressing the jointness, but when we go into a joint engagement around towards something, we don't go into some mind meld and lose our individuality. We're individual at the same time. So the blue parts are the action part. We have a joint goal like collaboration. We're gonna roll the ball together, but you have your role and I have my role. So in the one we did there, we we're rolling it back and forth, but maybe we're building a tower together and I put, I hold the block steady and you put another one on top. So we are jointly pursuing the same, a common goal, a shared goal, but you have your role and I have my role. So I have sub goal as it were. I have a goal with, to, to do my, I have a, the goal to uh, um, perform my role well, and you have the goal to perform your role well, and they're subordinated to the joint goal. Now, the green part is the uh, uh, perception part, as it were, uh, not the action part, but the cognitive part. We are jointly attending to something, maybe relevant to our joint activity, maybe something else. We're jointly attending, and at the same time, you have your perspective, and I have my perspective. So we're jointly attending to this watch, but you see the back of it, and I see the face of it. So we're jointly attending, but you have your perspective, and I have my perspective. And a lot of human communication, again, is about we're sharing attention to a topic of conversation, but you have your perspective on it, and you have your things that you know about it that I don't, and I have my perspective and my things that I know about it that you don't. So uh, you, have to have, you have to have both. The, joint, the, the, the shared intentionality schema is a dual level structure of sharedness, which is governing at the moment of the collaboration or the shared attention. That is the governing goal structure. Uh, and the roles and perspectives are the individual uh, uh, role in that larger social structure. So this is what I'm saying describes what children were doing in those videos you just saw that the apes are not doing. The apes are not engaging in this way. Okay, so what I wanna do um, uh, now that I can, uh, and I can sort of uh, adjust how much I do this given, given the time is I have a number of, remember the book goes over a lot of different domains uh, and I wanna go over uh, uh, several domains. I could go over all, I, I don't have time for all eight of them, but I'll go over a, a number of them. Just so you can see, how this different form of engagement plays out in different domains of development. So let's start with communication. Now, obviously, humans have a language, and uh, that's something, have one or another language, and um, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to just look at humans have uniquely, uh, have unique gestures, pointing and pantomiming, uh, iconic gestures, if you prefer that term. Um, and pointing, <laughs> I have a whole book that's mostly about pointing, so I, I, I could wax poetic about that topic for quite some time, because it's such a, a direct manifestation of this triangular engagement. I direct your attention somewhere, right? Now, just think about it for a minute. How in the world does that work? If I, right now, go for you, let's, let's imagine we're in the same room, and I go, okay, you look over there and you say, uh, okay, you don't even know what I'm looking at, what I'm pointing to. Am I pointing to that one book? Am I pointing to the bookshelf? Am I pointing to the, what am I pointing to? You don't even know what I'm pointing to, much less why I'm pointing. You have to guess, you have to read my mind. When I point to something, uh, that, let's say you know, we're in a lecture hall and, and you come in late and I point to an empty seat. You have to say, oh, he's pointing to the empty seat because he knows I need a seat and he's offering, there's an empty seat. He's okay, you have to do this mind reading thing with pointing. And that's why it's so much, so interesting relative to language. You know, I got to do a lot of that in language too. And I could argue that at length <laughs> with pronouns and everything else, uh, all kinds of uh, discourse inferences and whatnot. What but let's just for the moment, uh, uh, imagine that, or pretend that language is, is co encodes everything, again, which it doesn't, I know. But uh, the pointing, there's no code, there's no symbol, there's no nothing. I'm just directing your attention somewhere and you're having to, I would, I would gloss pointing is you're saying, I'm saying to you, look over there and you'll know what I mean, right? And I'm guessing that you will know what I mean if you look over there. Now, why am I guessing that? And we have what, 
um, a, a communication theory is called common ground. We have common ground about when you walk in the lecture hall and I point to the empty chair, we have common ground that you need a seat and so forth and so on. Common ground means we both know that we both know. So in any case, I've studied chimps' gestural communication quite a bit. Their vocal communication uh, is, I'm, I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but their, their, their vocal communication is mostly hardwired with a couple of exceptions on the margins uh, and is not really used very uh, much intentionally or flexibly. It's just a hardwired response to, uh, uh, to a predator or to food or to a threat of, in, in or whatever. Again, I'm exaggerating slightly, but mostly it's just hardwired, not used flexibly. We've studied their, how flexible their gestures are, and I'm not going to give you the data for that. Um, uh, and I think Erica Cartmill uh, is in your department, is she not? So she studies uh, that kind of thing as well. And um, so just you just give you the impression of how flexible and deliberate this looks. This is a, a little chimp that wants to go for a walk. Uh, and he doesn't want to go by himself because he's afraid to go without mom. And so he wants mom to come with him. Okay. And so, and, and this is not something that other chimps necessarily do. This is something this individual invented. We have all kinds of data for this. We have a very detailed study of the invention of certain gestures. So this is not a hardwired uh, vocalization. This is a learned behavior, a learned communicative behavior. But again, it's dyadic. It's, it's about you come, it's about we're gonna walk together, we're gonna walk, we're gonna groom, we're gonna play, we're gonna do something together. And this is, uh, very similar. This is from the same set of videos of the kid that held up a thing to show. And here's a pointing version of that. Okay. And now, trust me, if you follow it through, that little girl, 14 months old, does not want the father to fetch it for her. She doesn't want anything. She's just saying, oh, look, isn't that cool? There's a new toy over there. Isn't that cool? So this is the same as the showing, but it's in the pointing modality and its motivation is just sharing. And it's triadic in a way that the chimp gestures are not. It's reference. It's an act of reference. And, and by the way, a pet peeve of mine that I think um, tends to cover up the triadic nature is people say things like words refer or the pointing gesture refers. The right way to say it is people use words in order to make refer to, to invite others to share attention with them to this external thing. And, uh, and that's what she's doing. She is inviting her father to share attention with her to this external thing. So the point isn't referring, she as the agent is referring. Uh, iconic gestures uh, are also really important because they have a symbolic element, they stand for, and I think the very most primitive uh, iconic gestures are ones where I do with my body what you should do with yours. I show you how to do something. There are a lot more sophisticated ones and we've looked at some of them, but this is the most basic one. This is a 24 month old. She knows how to operate this uh, toy. We put a plexiglass barrier so she can't go operate it and the puppet is having trouble and she needs to show the puppet how to do it and you'll see her do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is my hand and I'm showing you what to do with your hand. I can show that again if you'd like. It happens fairly quick. Yeah, yeah. Do it like this. Here, do it like this. Uh, and by the way, iconic gestures do have a little bit more content than pointing, but they still require a lot of common ground uh, to interpret. My favorite example is I saw a little girl at an airport back in the days when we actually traveled. And uh, I saw her at the airport going through the... Um, uh, the, uh, the scanner, the, the um, security measures. And she walks through and she set off the, the uh, beeper and the airport security guard has his little hand wand and he scans the front of her. She's probably, I don't know, three or four or five, something like that. And he goes like this. Me, he wants her to turn around so he can scan. The, and she looks up at him like this and goes. <laughs> so she didn't know that his finger was representing her body and telling her body to turn, turn around her body because she didn't have common ground about how to use this uh, security procedure. So anyway, the common, the, the iconic gestures uh, 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 have more content to them than pointing, uh, but they still rely on common ground to a great degree, even again, uh, more than language, but somehow in between pointing and language. 
So, so, so here we are with pointing and iconic gestures uh, that are uniquely human. And, uh, you know, I got a couple of people in the ape world who want to say some things about, who want to make some claims about pointing and iconic gestures in a few cases with apes. And I don't believe those cases. Uh, and uh, there are hardly any of them. And I don't believe the ones that there are. So that's something that we could potentially uh, discuss uh, uh, is whether they can do this spontaneously or not. Um, okay, collaboration. Uh, which means just working together, like to pro solve a problem or something with a, uh, a toward a shared goal. Um, we have a whole series of these kinds of um, tasks. This is one where the child has seen a toy go in this tube and kind of knows how the tube works in general, but you can't do it by yourself. You have to eat, pull from either end and you're gonna see. Now, the experiment, by the way, is the adult is being difficult on purpose. And we want to see how the child uh, uh, adapts to the, the adult being difficult. And you'll see here, he's not doing his role. He's not pulling like he should. And the response is, do your part. <laughs> do it. She's tell the kid is telling him what to do. Uh, he knows the other role. The child knows the other what the other role is. This is a, something we've also, I'm not going to show you here, but we have an experiment showing that when they're collaborating, Children know the other role in a way that apes don't. Apes know what they need to do, but and they sort of respond to the other one. They know when the other one is in the right position and all that, but they don't really know the other one's role. Uh, and here we have um, this uh, child telling them what to do. Uh, the, the adult is only s neglecting her job for 15 seconds. That's the experiment. And now after 15 seconds are up, she goes back to it and they succeed in pulling it apart. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to show you a different task with the ape, and I can't, I can't show you the pulling apart the tube because when we gave the tube to the apes, they would grab one end with their feet and the other hand with their hands and they'd pull it apart by themselves. So, uh, so this is a different one. And this is one where, um, uh, and, and what I want you to focus on, they're actually going to be successful in the end. But what I want you to be focused on is the fact that uh, when she stops uh, doing her part, uh, the, uh, this is Annette again, you saw, you met Annette earlier. Uh, Annette is not going to try to engage her back in and point or tell her what to do. So now she stopped. Annette has lifted the, the, the door so that the human can look through and get the food. But now she's just like, well, you know, it's not working and I don't know why it's not working. And I can't, and so she goes over and tries to push the other one out of the way and reach through and see if she can somehow magically reach through without the door being lifted, which she can't. And now the uh, caretaker signals she's ready again. The 15 seconds is over. She lifts the door and they are successful in the end. But the point was the engagement is not the same. Even though they end up being successful, um, uh, uh, she's not reacting. The chimp is not reacting to the uh, stoppage in the same way. Now, people have said, well, what about if they did it, to, uh, did it two chimps together? We actually have two chimps. She, she has a adopted sister uh, that's also human raised with her and uh, they did it together and they were pretty much never successful. And the reason was because if they stumbled upon success, the one who got the food just ate it and didn't share it. <laughs> and so uh, there was no motivation and you're gonna see that right now. Um, so this is two chimp youngsters and this is this is from a, a, a film thing so it's got a soundtrack and stuff. but. Uh, uh, this is two chimp youngsters uh, collaborating to pull in food. Now, what we've done here is we have put food on each end of this board, and they have to pull together because this rope is just threaded through these hooks. And if you pull by yourself, it just comes out. And they had just a little training in this. They need maybe an hour or two of training to learn this. It's not a lot, but they have to learn that if you pull by yourself, it's hopeless and you're done and we take it away and show them that they're not gonna get anything. So they learn to wait for the other one. And uh, now you'll see what happens here. Uh, so this is actually, for this TV thing, um, this is actually two experiments in one. Uh, so the first part is this in incredibly impressive thing they do to show that they know they need the other one. So this chimp here, she's about four, I think, and um, she um, is the dominant one, but she gets there and she sees she doesn't have a partner. She knows the partner is behind this door and the door is locked and you'll see what she does. He realizes he can't do it on his own and removes the pegs to release the other. 
I mean, I was floored. This was Brian Hare's idea to try this. And um, I thought, this, come on, this is never going to work. And it's incredible, okay? So they know they need the partner and they will do something to get the partner. Yeah. And so that all works beautifully. Indeed. The trick is, uh, on the next trial, we're going to put the food in the middle. So what we've done here is we've essentially solved the problem for them of dividing the spoils of their collaboration, and we're not going to do that in the second one. Situation, the chimpanzees help each other. Now the food's in the middle. Will the two chimps still help each other as humans would? Sorry about the music. Now watch. This chimp knows she's the subordinate one. She knows what's going to happen. She doesn't really pull very hard, but she does a little bit. And obviously, here's what happens. But the dominant chimpanzee grabs all the food. So what happens on the next trial is obvious. The subordinate chimp quits, quits doing it. So this, when I think about people ask me sometimes, what would chimps need to do to evolve this more, you know, collaborative, cooperative, shared intentionality way of doing things? I mean, step one is you got to be able to share the spoils at the end. That's step one. Then you can evolve the, the cognitive skills for doing it. But the first step is a motivational one. That's been a position that Brian Hare has had for quite some time. We used to argue about it, but I, I think he won the argument. Uh, that's the first step is to, he, he, for him, the first step is tolerance around food, and bonobos are more tolerant around food uh, in, uh, than our chimps, uh, but still not nearly as much as, uh, as humans are. Uh, and here's human children, and I chose this video. They're in the same kind of situation. These are, these are four gummy bears, <laughs> gummy bearchen for you German speakers. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I'm not going to show you the part where, the, where they're divided. This is only the one where they're in the middle. And they're four gummy bearchen. And I, took, I chose this video because this little boy is going to act somewhat like the dominant chimp at the beginning. This kid is going to comment. So, anyway, so he comes over and starts to take them all. But you notice he doesn't take them all. I think he only takes one. And then he puts it back. This child comments, he's commenting, they're not on my side because he's had trials where there was some on his side. And so now he sees, oh, they're all in the middle this time. The other kid started to take them all, but didn't. No. <laughs> now the other kid starts to take them all, but the other kid says, no. And so he doesn't. And he takes two. And the other kid takes two, and they divide them two by two almost every time. So they can go on doing this all day, as, as much as their parents say they can have gummy bears, they can keep doing this. Um, and uh, because they have figured out a way to share the spoils fairly. Now, of course, sometimes one of the individuals will take more. I don't think I have the, a video for that, do I? No, sorry. Uh, sometimes one of the children will take more than their share, and the other kid says, wait, what are you doing? Okay, they protest. So, in, some of the philosophers call it moral protest. You know better than that. What are you doing? Uh, and the other one almost always relents. So they, how, old are these, uh, how old are these kids in the video? Three years old. Three years old. Uh, between three and less than three and a half all, in all cases. Uh, and so... Um, the uh, uh, it, uh, they almost always divide it two and two. Uh, they can handle quantitatively two and two. They can see the matching. Uh, and if one of them takes more, the other one pr almost always protests, and the one who took more almost always relents and equalizes. Okay, and that's a finding across two studies, and the other one being this one. And this is the, be the these are the best data I've ever gotten in my life. Um, uh, what we did here was. Um, uh, well, you, you, you can actually see it. The, the reward is this time not going to be gummy bears. It's going to be uh, these marbles. And you can just see over here, there's a little, uh, each of them has a little um, 
tube that they can throw the marbles down and they make this pling sound. So they really love the marbles. And so they're ready to collaborate and pull this in and watch what happens. Okay, whoops, we rigged it so that they collaborate and one of them by accident gets three and the other one gets one. And the little kid on the left is gonna look down and comment and say, I only have one. And so he comes over and gives them the other and they equalize. Now, <laughs> hear the little pling. <laughs> now, anybody who um, has worked much with three-year-olds is going to say, wait a minute, three-year-olds are selfish. You know, you, three-year-olds have something, you say, share some with your little brother and they don't do it. This is the point. If they have it in their grubby little hands, they're not very generous. But the title of this paper is that um, uh, collaboration facilitates equal sharing. So when they are collaborating, they divide them equally. So we have a control group that is meant to mimic uh, the, the other case. They come into the room and now the three marbles are already down here. They don't pull, there's no collaboration. And the one is over here. So the, we've reproduced the endpoint. Now this little child, the lucky, we call them the lucky child who gets the three almost never shares. So the actual data are in the control condition, he shares, I think, 11% of the time. And in the experimental condition, like 80% of the time, the, the distributions don't even overlap. And so, the time, and, and, and so then we did a chimp version. Now you're saying, well, chimps don't offer and share anyway. So how can you do that? We did it that um, uh, two come on my side, one comes on your side, and one is in the middle. And I, as the lucky chimp who has two, can prevent you from getting that one with some extra effort or not. And the question is, do they prevent the other one from getting the extra one more uh, or less when there's been collaboration or when there's been no collaboration? And the answer is it doesn't matter to the chimps. So the chimps are not taking into account that you deserve it because we collaborated together and the kids, that's one interpretation of this, is I'm giving you one because you deserve it. We, we generated them together. So again, the title of this paper was, uh, was I guess the full title was uh, Collaboration Facilitates Equal Sharing in Children, but not in human children, but not chimpanzees. Okay, so this is for me, and I, and I see, uh, uh, because Alan asked the question, he's, he's, he's in my <laughs> pictures that I can see there. Uh, this is one of Alan's uh, key dimensions here is a dimension of fairness and equality and exchange. And this is, um, I would say, the, the, the primal context for this is collaborative activity together. And we all know that... Um, for cooperation to get off the ground evolutionarily, you can't have free riders. You can't have ones who, who, who don't pull their weight and still get to share in the spoils. So um, in, the, in, the, in the case where the kids already got them, the, the other guy didn't do anything, but here I've got to share if I want to keep my collaborative partner, if I want to be, think of myself as a good collaborator, collaborative individual or whatever. Okay, so Children in their collaboration, they are both cognitively doing things that apes don't by engaging with them, bringing them in, they know the other role. So we've shown cognitive differences in the structure of the collaboration and motivational differences in the sharing of the spoils. And this has an evolutionary history. This is a maturational expression of something that uh, uh, of, has an evolutionary history that I would say goes back roughly 500,000 or 400,000 years ago, maybe more, I'm open to that, uh, but where humans are putting their heads together to accomplish things that neither one could ac accomplish on their own. And this collaborative thing from a more motivational dimension, and I even think of it in a moral or normative dimension, is that we are responsible for one another, we're interdependent. Uh, and so we treat one another specially because uh, we know that, we understand that. Social cultural learning. So um, great apes, uh, some of my earliest studies with apes, I, 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 I showed, I gave data that showed chimps not being great at imitation relative to humans. Andy Whiten's more recent research has actually shown that they're better than our original studies showed. But one thing great apes don't really do is teach. 
Uh, and uh, I won't go into it, but people like Gergely and Chibra, the, the Hungarian developmental psychologists, have argued that not only is teaching important, but that humans are human children are evolved to accept teaching in a certain way. They understand teaching to be the adult intends for me to know something and so forth. So anyway, I'll just show you in terms of reproducing actions. Here is, this is a, um, a light that you can turn on with your hand. The natural way to do it is press it with your hand. This is actually from the Gergay and Chibra's original 2002 nature study. Um, but this adult is doing it with a ball, which is unusual. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I, sh I should know better. Uh, and the little girl uh, would naturally, in a control condition, she would do it with her hand. But now she sees the adult do it with the ball, and she's going to use the ball too. So this is a level of fidelity of copying that you don't see in apes. Uh, you can get nothing like this quantitatively. And then, um, and then uh, just to show you how flexible it is, the adult is now going to do something different. Again, not with her hand exactly, but with her wrist, with the back of her wrist. And the child now does it with the back of her wrist. Right? So this is, this is a, 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 um, a, an involved part of cultural learning that humans engage in this um, um, pedagogy from the adult and reception to pedagogy, trusting the adult, following the adult's lead to a degree that apes don't. And um, I can see my time is getting a little bit uh, short here. So let me just say that we have another study where if apes already know how to do something, okay, I'll tell you the title of the paper and then you don't need to hear the study. Children conform to the behavior of others, meaning conform means even when they know how to do something, they see others doing it a different way and they change. Chimps stick with what they know. So once chimps know how to do something, they see somebody else do it also successfully or even more successfully a different way, they don't care. They stick with what they know. And the child, even if they know how to do it, they've been doing it successfully, they've been rewarded for it. If you want to take behaviorist terms, doesn't matter. They see somebody else do it a different way and they do it the different way. And here, uh, I, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. So uh, this, this little girl is five years old, so she's a little bit older. But this is a study where um, she's going to show this child the game. And the game is to put rice in a cup and take it over and pour it in the bucket. But you're going to see how the adult does that. She does this thing first. And now the child's turn. And of course, this is absolutely useless. It has nothing to do with anything, right? But that's what the adult did, so that's what we do. Uh, that, that's what the child does. And just to show you that it wasn't a fluke, this is she think, this is how we do it. Now there are various interpretations of this so-called over-imitation, called over-imitation because you can even quiz the child afterwards and ask them, is it to, to take the rice over to the bucket? Do you need to do this? And they can say no. They know it's not causally part of it. This, this is the work of other people more than myself. But, um, um, and, but still, and one interpretation of it is that it's a kind of a normative interpretation. This is how we do it. This is how it's done. This is the activity. The activity, this is, this is the way the activity is done. So it's, the child is not engaging with it instrumentally, they're engaging with it as a cultural practice, and the cultural practice is done a certain way. Okay, for purposes of time, I'm going to skip the thinking part. We all know about that. I was going to show you a clever thinking that, that an orangutan does and show you some children who are figuring out something together, but all of us operating as scientists all know none of us are Faustian philosophers in our in our in our attic figuring out things on our own everything we do is collaborative and i guarantee and nothing any of us has done could we have done by ourselves so uh, cooperative thinking means especially being able to use a language uh, where i can uh, tell you what i'm thinking about it and my perspective and you tell me your perspective okay so finally the last little domain i'll i'll, uh, I'll go over here is social norms and um uh, I'll skip the first part, and the, the, the first part was uh, we have a study where um, apes, um, where children are behave differently if they're being watched or not, which is a prerequisite for a social norm. You have to you have to know and care that other people are evaluating you, and the apes don't care. So um, uh, children will share more and steal less if someone's watching them. The chimps. Do the same no matter what. 
They don't care if someone's watching them. So that's a prerequisite for a social norm. And now here is third party enforcement. So now uh, that, what I said before uh, about the knowing somebody's watching you is still kind of instrumental, but the key and, and, and Rob Boyd was, has been, and, and Henrik have been very big on this, third party punishment is a key to scaling up to culture and keeping cooperation going in a culture. And this child is going to be observing the puppet playing this game. The child knows how to play this game and is observing the puppet playing it wrong. And you're going to see the child's reaction. Again, to watch, the child's arms are folded. The child's not playing. So it's not ruining the game for the child. This is third-party observation. And she's going to act, the child's going to actually tattle to the experimenter uh, who's there with her head down. She's supposed to stay out of it. You don't need to know the game. Die Hose. Die Hose ist richtig. Nicht der Schuhe. Falsch. Ich werde noch mal dachsen. Achtung. Ich werde noch mal dachsen. Oh. Oh. Der Schuh. Der hat geschummelt. <lacht> He's cheated. She's, he's <laughs> now I do I do sometimes uh, get the criticism. These are German children. German children are so uh, Norman, you know pro-social and norm and all that. Okay. Anyway, uh, we have a study in PNAS from 2007. We gave chimps all kind of opportunity to third party punish. I think Rob was a, was a reviewer on this paper, uh, third party punish. So um, if somebody steals something from the chimps, they retaliate in various ways. If somebody steals something from another chimp, they don't intervene. Uh, and in fact, even we even had uh, their kids, somebody stealing some food from their kids and they didn't intervene. Uh, uh, of course, if they hurt the, the, the kids, so they were separated and they pulled the food with a rope away from their kids so it wasn't physically threatening the child, just taking food that they had. And they didn't intervene. So they don't intervene in third party. So to have social norms, which is now our second step of culture, not just uh, you know dyadic engagement, but culture, uh, the, um, the, I, chimps don't have social norms. Of course, they have statistical norms. They know what's the normal behavior in their group and what's what's normal and what's not normal uh, in that sense of statistical normativity, but they don't have what one ought to do and what's the right thing to do and wrong thing to do, which uh, young children are getting from around three years of age. So using words about right and wrong, you saw that child use the word false, that's wrong. Uh, around three is when they start using those words appropriately. And uh, finally, let me just say, again, all this is behavioral, but there is potentially a, um, a morphological marker for humans' greater cooperativeness for people who like to have things that are tangible evidence. Um, uh, of the 200 or so uh, species of non-human primates, all of them have eyes that look like these chimped eyes here. They have white sclera, but they're, if they look straight ahead, you can not really see them. They have to be looking to the side. Uh, and children, it's something. It's uh, several times larger, more sclera. You can see it when they're looking straight ahead. Um, and there are various hypotheses about this. We uh, propose the cooperative eye hypothesis that um, um, uh, if you're in a group where people are always exploiting you and trying to compete with you, you don't want them to know where you're looking, right? And what? And so you have these normal dark eyes here, which you can't really see where somebody's looking with their eyes. You have to use the head. Uh, from any distance, from a, from a distance. With humans, you can advertise your eye direction. Why can you advertise your eye direction? Because you're in a cooperative environment. And so what we did, our actual study was, some Japanese researchers had, had documented the morphology across all primate species, uh, is we did a, a, gaze, a, a gaze following study and uh, with a two by two design. And if you close your eyes and look up, the chimps look up anyway. And if you look up only with your eyes, the chimps don't look up. So the chimps are following the head. And children, if you look up with your eyes only, they look up. But if you close your eyes and look up, they don't. So chimps are following the eyes. So, chimp, so humans are following eye direction. Chimps are following head direction. And this is potentially, I realize this is quite a leap uh, of inference. This is potentially because uh, 
they're in a cooperative environment. And we want to know when did they evolve these? And the problem is my, my, my evolutionary genetics colleagues in Leipzig uh, say the problem is we can't find any humans who don't have whites of the eyes uh, and not even any syndromes uh, with not whites of the eyes. Uh, so this seemed to have come under very strong selective pressure uh, where there's almost no variability. In the, there is variability in the human population, but not very much. Uh, and so anyway, this is potentially a morphological marker of the big change to a, a cooperative environment. Again, I realize it's a leap, but there you have it. So to conclude, uh, human children are adapted for cooperation and culture in ways that other great apes are not. I hope to, I've spent the last 20 years trying to demonstrate that uh, empirically with our comparative studies. And these adaptations are fundamental to uniquely human processes of cognition, communication, cooperation, and potentially even morality. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mike, for a great talk. Um, super interesting, lots to discuss there. I'm sure that we'll have some questions. Uh, if you could unshare your screen, that'll make it easier. Yeah. So we can see the array of people here. So I would just, um, I'm gonna take a list of people with questions and um, I will curate the discussion. Um, if you do have a question for Mike, uh, under the participant section at the bottom of your Zoom window, if you go in there, uh, there's an option to raise um, your uh, blue hand um, and I'll be able to see those and uh, call on you. So um, who'd like to go first with a question for Mike? Renee. Hi, thank you. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about uh, what you mentioned in the beginning of um, shared intentionality of humans being, I think you mentioned something of it being sort of incomparable to animals. Um, I think, I'm not sure whether you mentioned this actually, but like a dog, for example, uh, per, showing some sort of like toy to a human and then as basically in sort of my understanding of it asking the human to do something with it okay. or big cat like going towards their food bowl and meowing and like there's there's a lot to be said about dogs and i've studied dogs my colleague brian Hare here at duke has is the world's expert on dog behavior and I, there's a lot to be said but i'm just going to say one thing okay you don't see dogs doing that with other dogs. Okay? They're doing that with humans. They have, they have been domesticated genetically. They've been selected to cooperate with humans. They've been selected for herding and hunting and other activities. Um, and uh, uh, we have dogs following human pointing and doing all kinds of things. When you put two dogs in a room and you don't see anything you wouldn't see with any other two conspecific mammals in the same room. So. Uh, yes, it's a fantastically interesting special case, uh, but in their naturally evolved social behaviors with conspecifics, um, it's the general mammalian pattern would be my take. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, we, I've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, let's go with Patricia next. Mike, the, your data were amazing. The <laughs> videos you. were amazing. I want to so move to the level of evolution and perspectives on evolution. Um, I think that that you are very interested in what, and you said this, what happened after the split in the clade between humans, bonobos, um, and chimpanzees. But there's another question that I find equally interesting, which is, what was the common ancestor like? And I think because you're so interested in what happened after, you focus on the differences. I am equally or more interested in what the common ancestor was like. So I focus on the similarities. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, but so I want to, I think your focus leads you to sometimes exaggerate the differences. And I want to point to a couple of studies that we did that would indicate similarities in some things where you just talked yes. about differences. So one is, I don't know if you ever saw 
our study in Frontiers and Comparative Psychology about um, gestures. It's a, it's a case study of one bonobo, one chimpanzee, and one child early development. But there, um, and it's illustrated with a lot of um, video stills and mm -hmm. um, photographs. And there is huge at around age two similarity in yes. the way they're using it, not just the form of the gesture, but the way they're using it to communicate. So I'd love you to look at that paper. Um, and then the other one is um, a replication I did of Eleanor oh, with Sue Savage Rumbo. Oh, and these are all collaborations with her and, and her lab and Hi um, Heidi uh, Lynn, who spoke here this year. Um, on um, repetition and showing that her two children used repetition that, okay, that um, the chimpanzees and bonobos used repetition for the same functions, communicative functions as the children she had reported. Okay, but what I wanna point to now is um, you talked about vocalization as not being communicative in I hedged on that, but I did. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I want to just say what we found. We found, it, you can read the transcripts. This was published in Journal of Child Language. We found that they were using it, kind of, their vocalizations um, as kind of vocal gestures um, in the same way children do at the one word stage. So, uh, you know, again, okay. I think there are differences, but I think you're exaggerating them and okay. not giving credit to okay. the similarities. Okay, now the, the, the chimps, the chimps and the bonobos you're talking about, I do not want to say that they're like the dogs in any, in any, in any way. What they're showing the, is the great flexibility, but these are chimps raised by, chimps and bonobos raised by humans. And it shows you th that they can go down a, uh, a developmental path uh, that I would say is not the species typical one that you would see in the wild. And so this is incredibly important and interesting. That's why the work of uh, Sue Savage Rumbau and your work with Sue Savage Rumbau is so important, is showing that the, the uh, of the, 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 the plasticity and the flexibility of the ontogenetic pathway uh, when they are raised with, with individuals that communicate with them intentionally. In their natural habitat in the wild, Others are in, in communicating with them, but not in this triadic way and all of that. So they can adapt to that during their individual ontogenies. And that's absolutely fantastic. So I, pre, I, I plead guilty to exaggerating uh, because I'm focused on uh, their natural interaction with one another and not what they can adapt to if they uh, are raised in a, in a special environment. But I, I, I absolutely agree with everything that you said. There's, we have no conflict at all. Yeah, none of Nonetheless, the fact that they can adapt to a different yes. environment shows that the potential is there. Sure. And, and that, and it would be for certain, it would be uh, telling about the last common ancestor, as you said. You, you opened your remarks saying that. And I believe that's absolutely true. Yes. Okay. Great. So, okay. Thanks. Um, so next we have uh, Sasha, Dan, and then Raphael. So Sasha, go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if um, there's any evidence from the, the way that, that cooperation developments um, in humans, at least that, or from apes, that points to the domain that maybe cooperation developed in. I know that you focus on the foraging domain, but there's also like the cooperative breeding hypothesis. Yeah. And I don't know if there's like evidence pitting those two against each other. Well, but, there's... <laughs> There's a discussion pitting the two against each other where uh, Sarah Hurdy and uh, uh, Kristen, Kristen Hawks have uh, uh, argued that, uh, uh, or to, to put it in a nutshell, as Sarah Hurdy said to me, oh my God, you're on the man, the hunter still. Okay, but uh, uh, so she wants the cooperative breeding. And uh, uh, I personally think they go together. I mean, the, the cooperative breeding goes with collaborative foraging, it seems to me. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, why do you need cooperative breeding? Because some of the females are busy doing stuff like hunting or gathering or whatever. And so um, uh, uh, I don't see them as oppositional. And in fact, uh, 
uh, we have written some stuff where I have taken account of cooperative breeding as part of the picture. Uh, and here's what I would say is my final take on it at the moment is that, remember I said with the apes that maybe the first step was tolerance around food and that kind of thing. I do think that cooperative breeding makes for more pro-social behavior. People have shown that uh, in general, but I don't think it gets you to things like uh, conventions, norms, and institutions, which are cognitive phenomena. So I think the, that, that the cooperative breeding is working on the motivational structure of just being nicer, being more uh, pro-social, uh, less aggressive, less dominance-based, and so I think that that um, that cooperative breeding may have started the motivational relaxation uh, of of aggression that you see uh, so much in chimps, especially. And um, and but then I think you need more stuff on top of it. So the more stuff on top of it, so it's the it's the instigating uh, uh, characteristic, but I think you need more. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, then next we have uh, Dan and then Raphael. Dan. Uh, I'd love to hear Raphael's comments, so why don't you come back to me if there's time? Sure. Raphael, do you want to? Uh... Hi, Raphael. You're muted. Hi, good to see you. Sorry, um, thank you, Dan, thank you. Um, and thanks, Mike, for a nice talk. So my question is more on the, maybe a little theoretical. So when you refer to capacities, uh, which you mentioned at the beginning of the talk, and then there's all these capacities. So we could go one way saying capacities that are- a carefully like, chosen word. The capacity is not just an accident. It's so a let, me, let, me, let me ask a question. So on the one hand, we could go the way like, like domain general capacities, like bipedal locomotion and, and you know, keeping verticality and balance. And then along the same lines, domains, specific capacities like windsurfing and uh, you know snowboarding which would recruit some of these domain general so i was wondering uh, in your domain let's say uh, when we go into cognitive things or social skills and morality is there like a line between the two or is it a gray area between domain specific domain general when it comes to capacities because clearly one of them you need culture to scaffold and generate the actual behaviors and other ones yeah, may not. I mean, I mean, it's both of them. Both of those ways of operating are are there, and we from the beginning. I've always had an ethological bent where you have specific uh, behavioral adaptations, cognitive adaptations for specific problems. But in this case, what you have is that in, in the shared intentionality, it's whenever you're doing something with somebody else. <laughs> Okay, so that can be you're, you're collaborating toward a, a common goal or you're, uh, and, and you have to relate to one another a certain way. So it cuts across the, the specific domains because it has to do with how you relate to others whenever you interact uh, with them. So in that sense, you would call it domain uh, general. But if you, if you said something like, uh, you know, navigating in space to find food of uh, either primates or hunter-gatherers, shared intentionality, can't, you can do that together with others, but you can do it on your own too, in which case it would be more of a domain-specific uh, ability to find your way in space. And if the two of you were doing it together and discussing which way to go in space or whatever, you're still both relying on the fact that you both have these uh, individually evolved skills that evolve somewhere early in, in mammalian, if not before, uh, cognition for, for, for wayfinding in space. So I, I think it's both, and I think you have to roll up your sleeves on any particular problem and, and talk and, and, and investigate the, the more particular skills involved and the more uh, general level skills involved. I also have been interested recently in some more of these things, executive function kinds of things, which are more domain general as well, um, being able to uh, uh, inhibit things and whatever, which uh, you know might be more evident in some domains than others, but might also be domain general. So I think it's both. And, and I definitely, um, I have, I have from my undergraduate days, I've had an ethological bent of thinking about, and in the sort of evolutionary psychology uh, kind of mode of having, uh, to me, one of the great contributions, the, in many ways, the uh, greatest contribution of the Tubian Cosmides uh, take on things is this focus on 
um, cognitive adaptations as solutions to specific problems. You can't just say being smart is a good thing, so humans evolved to be smart. You have to say there's a specific problem that they evolved to solve. And the shared intentionality evolved to solve certain collective action problems or joint action problems or collaboration problems. It might potentially have been some of the uh, things to do with cooperative breeding. But again, I, I think the one that generated most of the cognitive architecture is collaborating toward a joint goal in something like collaboration, uh, in something like collaborative foraging. Thank Raphael, you. do you want to follow up or? Oh, I would love to, but I, you know, we're running up. <laughs> I know there's no time, but I would love to pin you more on um, on certain areas, but okay. okay. This is a this is a great great answer, and I, I I don't want to take all the time, but thanks a lot. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go to Dan. Dan, how are you? I'm well. Thank you. Nice to see you, Mike. Thanks for a really good talk. Um, uh, I, I'm actually glad that uh, I I asked Rafael to to go ahead because my question is sort of more of the same, but even more extreme in the sense that um, like I I find all of the material that you've presented compelling and, and the work of others whom you've cited as compelling as well. Um, and yet at the same time, um, kind of all of that can be true and still incomplete um, if we're not attending, not just to domain specificity, but actually sort of content full prepared learning domain specificity, right? So as I'm sure you remember from, uh, from Leipzig, you know, uh, Clark and Tanya's work on on children's prepared learning for, for dangerous animals. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I've suggested that the same may be true for children's learning about fire. Um, there's reason to think that the same might be true for disease avoidance. So for example, you've talked about morality, right? Um, uh, in, in very broad terms of sort of, um, uh, uh, I would say blending the, the, the conventional and the moral in the sense of this is the way we do it, which is conventional, right? Yeah. And this is the morally correct way to do it. And there's good reason to think that, you know, that that those should be disambiguated in children's yeah. minds. That they yeah. should, yeah. And, and they should attend particularly to local moral regimens so that they, they, they really learn the things that um, will get them rewarded and punished, for example. So uh, what I'm basically asking you is how much, how much do you, um, see what you're doing as a, a platform for, but that the next step then has to be looking at content, looking at something like grammar for particular, very specific domains. Uh, I mean, the way I would think about it is by the time humans started doing this sort of shared intentionality kind of relating to one another a half a million years ago, they had so many contentful domains already there, okay? So I'm just saying that Thing that, that, that they're, um, and so I'm uh, absolutely on board with all of those. So certain things having to do in our book on primate cognition from 1997, and we're revising it this year, finally, we're gonna, we're gonna revise the primate cognition book. There are all these domain specific things about, about uh, uh, ca causality with tools and about quantities and about um, uh, certain kinds of, uh, uh, categories of objects and whatnot, and so I'm on board with all of that. And uh, and with humans, we still have uh, many or a lot of those, uh, maybe all the ones that chimps have or whatever. But then we learn to relate to one another differently, and the way we relate to one another differently uh, means anything we're doing, whether again it's wayfinding in space, or we're arguing about a mathematical problem, or we're trying to figure out how to make a new tool that we can use collaboratively. Whenever we relate to one another, uh, you could call that domain specific if you wanted to. This is how I relate to others when I cooperate with them. Uh, in fact, when I, I, I gave a talk at Santa Barbara maybe two years ago, and the one finding that Lita uh, really grasped onto was, oh, when they collaborate, they share fairly. And when they don't, they don't. This is the cue, right? This is the specific cue. When you collaborate, it it it, it uh, you know it 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 tells you to share fairly, and if you don't, you don't. So um, you can view the way I think of evolution uh, is as a hierarch is hierarchically, and we're relating to one another. But then there are these specific things. So I think there's this this evolution of these capacities for uh, collaborating with others 
have these sub things that go on and sharing the spoils would be one of them. And they're in the context of the overall collaborative activity and maintaining my relationship with my collaborative partners. So I am absolutely in favor of all of the contentful things, but this, um, uh, this way of, new way of relating to people, I wanna say transforms many other domains uh, as you, one of the things I've argued in the, in the more cognitive side of the picture, um, if you think about that, that, that diagram I showed, this whole notion of perspective, which we take for granted, that um, you and I are looking at this thing, but we see it differently, or we're thinking about, you know, whatever it is, the American election, and you're seeing it that way, and I'm seeing it this way. This notion of we can look at the same thing, but see it differently. I believe that is a cognitive, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, it's a cognitive capacity that evolved in the context of our collaborating and communicating about our collaboration. And so that would be not an evolved separate capacity for a separate, it would, be, it would evolve to solve a problem within the larger problem of collaborating with someone. That's why I started by saying it's hierarchical. And so I think when, when some large scale activity comes under selective pressure, like collaborative foraging, you have so many things underneath it that have to, uh, and, and, and you could think of them, I'm perfectly happy if you say, following Lita, if you say, there's a little, you know, punctate adaptation for when you, when, you, uh, uh, when you collaborate, you share fairly, and when you don't, you don't. But it evolved under the general rubric of you have to treat your partner well to keep your collaborative partners to be able to collaborate. So that's why I said hierarchical, and I'm talking about something that's a fairly high level uh, uh, activity with lots of sub components to it. And the subcomponents can be contentful and the stuff you're doing can be contentful. Um, and you can even think of the, of the collaborative thing as being a, a, a the shared intentionality as a contentful specific adaptation. It's just that it has ramifications across many other domains whenever you're interacting with others uh, collaboratively. So sorry, that was kind of long-winded, but... Um, no, no, thank you. Can I follow up on, on, on something you said there um, briefly? So um, this the, the, the phenomenon that you observed that the children, when they collaborate, then they share, um, where do you think that comes from? I mean, I'm talking in the ontological sort of sense, <laughs> like, is it, uh, is that learned? Does, is it arrived at through reason? No, so in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, um, in the, in the, um, in the, in the stuff I've written, the natural history of human morality, I say there's sort of two steps. One of them is natural morality, which uh, I don't think is taught. And then the more cultural, so cultural norms and all of that, uh, uh, that is on top of it. So I think you have both of those layers. And I think there's a natural sense of sympathy. And my main evidence for this is that very young children show sympathy for others. And the sense of fairness, uh, I, I, let me just concentrate on that experiment for a minute. So I've had people say, okay, the kids in your experiment, they pull together, three to one side, one, they share fairly because their parents have taught them to share fairly, okay? However, in the control condition where they walk in the room and it's three to one, they don't share fairly. So if you want teaching from parents to be responsible for what we observe, you have to say that these German parents are teaching their kids when you get stuff collaboratively, you share fairly, but when you get it on, but when you just find it, you don't have to. And I have, I have trouble uh, believing that the parents would teach that fine grain of thing. They would be teaching them to share because it's nice to share and so forth. So anyway, I, I, I don't think, um, and, and let me draw one other sort of fine distinction here that's, that actually plays a role in the book. Um, I think, I don't, I never have liked the innate acquired or nature nurture kind of uh, distinction. And uh, what I'm really would rail uh, would argue against here is teaching from the adults, like enculturation and teaching from the adults. There's a natural morality. It doesn't mean you don't have to have any experience. It might be a child on a desert island wouldn't develop a sense of fairness. You have to interact with others. You have to see how your actions affect them, how their actions affect you, and then you naturally develop a sense of fairness with no one having to teach you. So it's not that it's it's innate hardwired, it's that the capacity, and that's why I say the capacity word is 
very uh, um, carefully chosen. The capacity is maturational, uh, but to see the actual exercise, its realization in behavior, uh, you have to go through individual experience and learning, uh, but not getting taught by people in the culture. Right. That makes sense. I guess what I was wondering is looking at, at the, you know, just looking at the films that you presented, you know, it seems like there's a possibility that there's some reasoning going on there on the part of the child, right? Because, um, and, and I mean, I agree with you about teaching that, you know, these norms don't necessarily have to be taught by parents, but you could imagine that children could learn the logic of, um, yeah. you know, aspects of the logic of fairness by, and so one of them is something like merited, you know, what, what um, you know, yeah. things like rights and duties and obligations, right? And so you could imagine that in some ways, um, there's something communicative about your experiment where if they come into the room and one of them just has three and one of them has one, they could interpret that as, you know, I'm, I'm justified in, they, it was given to me <laughs> and therefore I'm entitled to it. Whereas in the other case, uh, you know, yeah. they work together. And, and so it, there's an interesting question there, how much reasoning um, and on what yes. premises is, go, you know, um, yeah, and you'd you'd want to see the, the, some kind of flexibility there, but but you know we've done studies where we try to get it uh, outside of the resource allocation kind of thing, like taking turns, standing in line for things and whatnot. And again, you see it around age three, children are reasoning in a similar way that if he was in yeah. line first, then he deserves to get it first, and if you weren't in line, you can't cut in line, and things like that. Right. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm, mi I'm mindful of the time. We're at 1.31. We have one more question from Alan. If it, Mike, if you don't mind, would can That's you? That's fine. Okay. Well, a lot of this is right in Alan's wheelhouse. So I'm <laughs> let's, happy to... let's take one quick question from Alan and that will be, that will be our last. Alan, go ahead. You're muted. Yeah, sometimes it unmutes when I hold the space bar and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know what the difference is. Um, wonderful talk, Michael, and a, a pleasure to see you and a pleasure to hear you summing all this up and a, a really uh, <clears throat> impressive, impressive set of data theorizing and shall we say career. Not that it's over, but so far. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the question I would ask, and I don't know if there's any short answer to it, but you talk about capacities but you didn't talk much about dispositions, emotions, and motives. That okay. is the things that move people. So there are lots of things I can do that I don't do, uh, and lots of things that I can't do that I'm motivated to try to do. So ch children need not only a capacity, capacity to learn language, they need to, they need to want to learn. And they need not only a capacity to imitate, but what you see in every <laughs> toddler is they love to imitate. It's self-rewarding, it's a joy. So I wonder. Well, there, there there is a short answer. I agree with you totally that all of these okay. things are going to have they're going to have um, uh, evolved capacities and evolved predispositions or preferences or motives that go with them. And in evolution, you know, you've got to have both. You can't have uh, a, a capacity that you don't have any motive to do. It can't get selected if you don't do it. And yeah. and uh, conversely, you can't have a motive without uh, the the skill to do it, or it won't get selected. So absolutely, they go together. And the word capacity, I would use broadly enough to include motivational capacity. I know that's a little bit of a oxymoron, but but uh, but it's important. For example, when you when you let when you give one of the one of the balls to the other, or whatever those objects were, yeah. that you're motivated to give up one of the yes. balls. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's not just that you see it's not fair. But you're not happy with it, even though you have more. No, you're 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 motivated to correct the situation. Absolutely, yes. No. Great, thank you. Wonderful talk, and great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, so with that, let's conclude our um, let's conclude our official question and answer session. And uh, please uh, join me in um, thanking Mike for coming and giving a great talk. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.